Welcome to week three of Christian Evidences. When we left off last week, we were talking about postmodernism and its effect on the effectiveness of apologetics. So we're going to pick up there, and I'll just remind you that I uh, did a history of theistic arguments, and I ended with modern atheism and the discussion of the fact that it's relatively new, and I called it unnatural. Um, I was discussing the fact that this book really highlights the, the, the truism that atheism is a modern construct. So you see the atheism in its heyday is about a 200-year span from 1789 to 1989. 1789 marking the falling of the Bastille and the French Revolution, kind of the first attempt to say we don't need the church, we don't need religion to construct a government. And then, of course, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of uh, Soviet-style communism in 1989. These were atheistic movements at their heart. In fact, to be a communist in the Communist Party, you must have been atheist. In fact, that's true today in China. That's true today in North Korea. Uh, communism is, at its heart, atheistic. And if it was claimed that these atheistic governments, these movements that did not need God, were going to somehow create a better society, that religion only got in the way. Well, the proof is in the pudding. And the truth is, is that the 20th century was the deadliest century in the history of humanity by far, even allowing for the fact that the population rise. Because all you have to do is look at communist, atheistic um, Soviet Union to see death on such a grand scale that's unimaginable. And even that pales in comparison to death in communist, atheistic China um, after the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So these supposedly um, kind and um, good governments slaughter their people by the tens of millions through famine, through concentration camps, all in the name of somehow constructing a utopia, a society without God. And so um, I highly recommend this book to you by Alistair McGrath, The Twilight of Atheism. We left off there, and I want to move on and talk about, um, answer, answer the question again about uh, do apologetic arguments work? So we started off with this slide last week and the uh, definition of postmodernism. Uh, a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, subjectivism, or relativism, a general suspicion of reason, and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. Most people date the start of postmodernism somewhere around 1960. And that's where there wasn't some grand shift, but there was a noticeable shift in the way that people in the Western world began to think of truth, the way they began to think of authority. Now, I'm not going to argue that postmodernism is in and of itself bad, and I'm also not going to argue that postmodernism is in and of itself avoidable. In other words, you can't choose to be modern when you live in a postmodern world. We are all postmodernists, and we all are going to view the world through that lens. We don't really have a choice. My favorite example of this is uh, goes back to 1963. Of course, that was before I was alive, but um, uh, just bear bear with me here. In 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And within a few minutes, CBS News uh, was on the air on TV and uh, talking about the fact that the president had been shot. The reason I know this is because um, 50 years after uh, that event, CBS News did a live web stream that showed exactly what they were broadcasting at that very moment. And so you had basically the feel of what someone would have had uh, in 1963 had they had their television on when CBS broke into some uh, soap opera. And so they had this live stream on their 
um, uh, website. And so, and I watched the first hour or so of what it was like that day back in 1963. So for the first few minutes, it was simply um, uh, an audio feed with some kind of message on the screen about a, a news bulletin. And then finally, after a few minutes, uh, Walter Cronkite appeared on the screen. Walter Cronkite represents um, the modernist culture um, in the sense that he was looked at as being a reliable news person. People thought Walter Cronkite just gave them the news. So when a person watched the news in 1963, the assumption was they simply reported the facts. That you could trust the news, you could trust Walter Cronkite because they simply reported what was the truth. Well, Walter Cronkite, of course, is um, dismayed, um, but at the same time has to go on the air back in 1963 to talk about the fact that the president has been shot. And he really doesn't have enough information other than he's been shot. And, and of course, information just trickles in and pretty quickly um, they start to figure out that he's in bad shape and it doesn't take much longer to figure out that the president is dead. So here's the thing. Within, I'd say, five minutes, Walter Cronkite mentioned the grassy knoll, or I think he called it a grassy hill, which uh, of course later became famous and is part of uh, many of the theories, I'd say even conspiracy theories about what happened. But I don't want to get into that. What I want to focus on is what Cronkite said within, I'd say, uh, another 10 minutes, which is he started offering up speculation as to who could have done this. And he said this could have been the work of right-wing extremists. And he mentioned the fact that some right-wing extremists had been active in uh, the Dallas area in the months before that. And so he assumed that some right-wing extremists did not want to see JFK um, continue as president. Well, it certainly is the case that there were a lot, a lot of right-wingers out there that did not like JFK. But it's also the case that it was actually a left-winger, a communist, named Lee Harvey Oswald who pulled the trigger and who killed JFK. Why is it then, with no information, that Walter Cronkite offered up that it might have been a right-wing extremist? And I suggest to you because, in his view of reality, the only person uh, who logically could have done this would have been a right-wing extremist. And so he showed here his own bias. Now, of course later he wouldn't stand by that, but when he simply had to show what he, at his gut level, thought. He assumed it was a right-wing extremist. Because he's a human being. And when we're human beings, we don't have the option of simply reporting the facts. We are going to let our biases, known and unknown, affect how we view the world and how we interpret the data. It was not long after that that the uh, Warren report was uh, issued. It took a few years to do a, um, an investigation to say it was Lee Harvey Oswald. He was a single shooter. And one of the most amazing things is you had this official investigation, the most in-depth murder investigation in the history of humanity before or since. And many, many Americans didn't buy it. And, and many still don't. Because they assume that you can't trust those in power to tell the truth. So this is a major sea change that happened again in the 1960s. So um, my big point is this. First of all, people no longer look to the news media simply to state the facts. They don't think that uh, that happens. And so you have people who watch Fox News or people who watch MSNBC or people who watch CNN. And we know that they're going to give us news from a certain angle. We might agree with that angle, we might disagree with that angle, but we don't believe that you can just give the facts. And secondly, even if there is some great um, august panel who uh, puts together all the facts for us, and we say we can trust these people, we still are suspicious uh, of their motives if they come and say and report on anything, whether it be on the Warren Commission or some other one. So. If it's a scientist who says we've discovered this and because of that all of humanity must react in a certain way, you know that a lot of us are going to say, I'm not doing that. I don't believe you. I think you could be wrong. That's just a postmodern reaction to authority. Postmodernism is at its heart a reaction to modernism. 
So the modern world told us we can know things through science. We can know truth if we simply take the right approach, do the right tests, and um, use the what we call the scientific method. If we do this properly, we can come to truth. And in many ways, this has been a great benefit to humanity, especially in terms of medicine and especially in terms of technology. Our world is much better off than it was 50, 100, 200 years ago. But at the same time, when we see that many of the great meta-narratives, as we discussed last week, that we use to kind of construct our reality to say, for instance, we're Americans and we live in a great country because uh, we're founded on freedom and that kind of thing, they don't necessarily work for everybody. And there are a lot of, yeah, but how about this? Yeah, how but? How about the fact that this free country was, uh, in many ways, built on the backs of slaves? How about this free country was uh, the result of many bait-and-switch deals made with the Native Americans? That's a postmodern take on American history. Not simply to say we accept the received narrative, but we're willing to challenge it and say, no, there's another way of looking at this, and you don't have the truth. And so we're very suspicious that one person or one entity can just give us the truth. And in many ways, this is a healthy skepticism. But it also has also led to what you might call throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So that not only are we suspicious of uh, authority figures and their ability to actually understand and tell us the truth, but many, many people in the modern Western world are suspicious of whether or not there is truth at all. And this is where postmodernism ultimately implodes or it kills itself. Postmodernism uh, arose as a reaction to modernism. Modernism made some great promises. It promised that through science and through education, the world would become a better place and we could really get this thing right. And postmodernism said, it's not happening. And in many ways, all the modernist world brought us was uh, science in to be used by the powerful. So if the modern scientific world brought us um, great advances in technology. It also brought us great advances in uh, warfare so that carnage in World War I and World War II were so much greater than all the wars in the history of mankind put together uh, because we had science to show us how to kill people better. It certainly worked, but the question is, is that better for the world? So the postmodern says, you know, uh, you offered a lot of promises, and you didn't fulfill all of them. So in the next video, what I want to do is talk about what is the modern world, what was it good for, what is the postmodern world good for, and how do we move forward in our discussion of truth.